Talking about an, an emotion that I think it's so, so significant, uh, fear, worry, anxiety, loneliness, because it is something that has plagued our society. I feel like the, the, the statistics, it's getting higher every day. The number of people who struggle with anxiety, with fear, and, and all of that, it's, the number increases every day. And I'm not going to try to say I can deal with the, the issue of anxiety and fear and worry all from one perspective. We need a holistic perspective. So uh, uh, from a foundation lane, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a mental health professional. Uh, so there are some people who are going to need mental health professionals to be able to help them navigate. There are some people who have, it's a medical condition. Biologically, their brain has some things that don't go well. They need medication for them to not have anxiety just overtake their being. So we have those. But I'm coming as a pastor, and I'm going to deal with this from a spiritual perspective, from a biblical perspective. And I strongly believe in my spirit that you will be changed, that you walk from here, and you walk with a lot more peace, with less stress and less anxiety, that God will walk a walk in, in, in the inside of each one of us that will make life different and easier and enjoyable because anxiety and fear actually steals the joy and the life that we are supposed to live uh, each day. Uh, so a quick thing on my introduction. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Anybody ever says, but I'm always anxious? I'm anxious about everything? Like, yeah, you read the Bible, like, oh, the Bible, be anxious for nothing. They're like, well, I'm anxious about everything. Don't put your hand up just in your heart if it's you. <laughs> yeah. There are times even when we know God says be anxious for nothing. We are anxious about, will I have enough money when I retire? Oh, if I travel, will I come back safely? Oh, if I do this, how will the outcome? Like we are anxious about, we wake up in the morning and the first thing that hits us is anxiety about how the day will look like. So the day is spoiled before the day starts. I, I like this author, Brené Brown, if you can pick any of her books, especially the book on vulnerability, it is amazing. She is so, she, she studies uh, just human psychology and all of that and talks about the power of vulnerability and the power of embracing shame and all of, and just the things that come with that. And I, I was amazed when I was um, reading her book uh, or listening to her book, how, because I was li listening to this one was on the, aud the audio version of it, but she has several other books, and how she talks about how powerful shame is. But the, the time when we get to the place where we are willing to embrace shame, know that it's okay, like there's nobody who never goes to a place where they are not ashamed. Embrace that as part of life, the freedom we are going to get. There are many people who, ne who never tried something because they were ashamed of what, how other people are going to see them and look at them. There are many people who are not really enjoying their life because they are ashamed and concerned about how they will look in the eyes of somebody else. And they are stopping their own enjoyment and their own freedom because of what another person thinks and how another person sees them and how, how they look or how they will look. But what if you just press the button and close the door to how everybody else thinks and just enjoy the life? I know it's okay to be ashamed and just embrace each part of the journey. How sweet life would be. If you have to dance crazy, you dance. Even if your steps go zigzag, it's okay. You still just enjoy it. So that's, that's, my, that's my goal. Can I go back to my introduction? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, why is anxiety and fear very dangerous? Or why is it increasing? Um, uh, the Bible tells us that in the last days that was going to happen. So in Luke chapter 21, the Bible says, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. This is, um, uh, the author of Luke is telling us about the prophecy when he was writing about things that were going to happen. And if we see, especially after COVID, the, num the amount of, uh, the rate of anxiety has gone really up. Because the Bible says men's heart are going to be afraid when they start seeing the things that are going to happen. And when scientists say it's going to be worse, there are some people, maybe you're in your 60s and your 70s, but the anxiety that is killing you is not what is happening in your age group. It's what is going to happen to your grandchildren. 
and you are not living the life that you have now, you are so, you are so anxious about your grandchildren, the world they will live in, guess what? God's grace will be with them the same way God's grace has been with you. So what if you just lived now and not worry about them, knowing that they are going to be taken care of? But the Bible says because of the things that were going to happen in the days to come, the fear and anxiety is going to increase in the hearts of people. There are some people who will not travel out of Nebraska or they will not go out of America because they think everywhere else in the world is so dangerous and they never get to explore the beauty of God's creation in other parts of the world because of anxiety and fear and all of that. So my prayer is that God is going to help us, that's going to break that thing from the inside of us. So what is anxiety? Uh, this, is a, this is a definition that I got from a uh, Christian counseling um, uh, uh, organization, so it's not my definition. Anxiety is a biblical term that encompasses both fear and worry. Uh, it is like an umbrella term, so it covers fear and worry. When somebody's anxious, it means there's fear and there's worry all involved. Fear relates to something from the past, perhaps something you would, you would do anything to keep from ever happening again. It drags it drags that event into the present and paralyzes you with fear, at least in some way. So let's say I'm a, growing up as a kid, maybe, oh, this is a real practical one. Growing up as a kid, uh, not really as a kid, as a teenager, I used to sing a lot. I sang in the choir and did a lot of solos and special things for different events and all of that. And there was one day there was an event in another town and my friend and I, you know, have you ever sang with somebody who always goes off key? <laughs> and uh, that day we are on stage and then she just goes off key. And I'm like, Lord have mercy. And we tried to guide her, but it was just chaos. And what is funny, like there was this person that I respected so much, was like a mentor. And he came and told me, never go on stage to sing again. Yes. It took me so many years, so many years to ever overcome that thing in my head to never go on stage to sing again. So many, it was years and years later that I was like, no. If God has given me this voice, I'm going to sing for him. It's okay. If I go off key, that's okay, but I'm still going to sing. But there are times, so can you imagine, that was, that was something that happened in the past that had come into the future. I was hindering the, me from living in the present, trying to think that maybe if I try to sing again, the same event is going to happen. And there are many of us who might not be singing. There are many of us, there are things that we are not doing now because of something that happened in the past. And God constantly tries to give you an opportunity like, hey, just try. You're like, ooh, I'm not. They, I'm a, statistics say most of them, when somebody has a car accident, if they don't go back to driving immediately, they might not be able to drive again because of the fear and the anxiety. Oh, what if I enter a car? And so most often the way to overcome that is not to stop from doing it. It's going to go back and do it and overcome. Because if you don't overcome it, it's going to be like a cycle and you'll never be free from that thing that you're anxious about. So it's important to always go back. Why am I afraid of this? What is it that is triggering this in the inside of me? Because at times it's subconscious, we don't even realize it. What is it that is triggering this in, inside of me? Do I have to go back and go to the, what the roots, the origin of this and be able to deal with it so I can walk in freedom? Because if I don't go back to the origin and see why I respond to this particular thing this way, then I might not be able to ever have victory. And then what is fear? Fear is an apprehension of evil that normally leads one to either flee or fight. It has a power to debilitate or demoralize. You are so afraid that something bad would happen. That anytime something, somebody is coming and they are trying to relate with you and because of fear you're just like, whoa, the wall is up. And most often the people who relate with you don't even know why the wall goes up. But because there is a certain degree of fear inside, then we just want to fight or we want to run. But we are God's people. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So, are there some things that you are afraid of and why are you afraid? And it's funny, at times when we think about fear, we are thinking, oh, maybe, oh, it's, I'm afraid of heights, it's, I'm afraid of this. No, at times it's afraid of being losing control. 
I feel like that's the biggest fear in the church. What if I lost control? If, I don't, if I'm not really involved, it might not work the way it should work. When did you become Jesus? Or in my job, or if I don't really do it, if I don't give it, there are some people who will never delegate because of fear. Fear of losing control. The next thing is fear torments the fearful, directing you to more towards protecting yourself from that thing that you fear, and it causes you to turn inward. Anytime you are afraid, most often you start like getting inward because it takes you away from the thing that you fear and you turn inward. And most often the opportunities that God will bring to your life is going to be tied to the thing that you fear. <laughs> and so if you can't overcome your fear, you can't live your life to its fullest. That's why I like how Eric just picks people, say, hey, would you help us lead worship? And so even like, oh, I'm so scared of speaking in the crowd, but then you still brave the fear and still speak. And you realize it's not as bad as I thought. And then so next time when I ask you to preach or do a sermonette, you're like, oh, yeah, I can do that because the fear is being crushed. Fear torments the fearful, directing them. Okay, I already am a set. Oh, yeah, fear torments the fearful, directing them more, more and more towards um, or protecting yourself from the thing that uh, you fear. It turns your focus inward. And as anxiety escalates, your productivity decreases. So when somebody is fearful and anxious, the more anxious they get, the less productive they become. Because when, some, when, when anxiety gets to a certain level, at times people can't sleep because they're anxious. I remember during COVID, uh, I didn't even know that I was dealing with anxiety. I was, I would, I would... I was doing funerals because you're a pastor. I was still going to hospitals to visit. And most of the funerals, I was in a small town. People were not wearing masks. So you had to be there, had to do funerals. I had, and I'm so grateful to God I never had COVID any, not even a single time the whole season. I was doing funerals. I was visiting people in their homes. I was going to hospitals. I was involved like one. Some people say, oh, pastors, except for preaching on the screen, I was like 100%, there was no slowing down at all. It was actually intensified at that time. And one of my concerns was some of the older people that I would have to visit. There are times you have been in a funeral with like two, 300 people, you don't even know who is exposed, and then you have to go visit someone else who is older and you're so concerned about. And I feel like that was one of the greatest anxiety that I have. God, I don't want to expose this person to something that will make them sick. You know, like the guilt that comes with that. If they fall sick and it's you are the cause of that, you're like, oh God, please, I don't want that to happen. So I was all, the whole season, every time I had to go, they would say, call up, Pastor Obama, can you come? And I'm like, do I have to come? Can I? But I knew I had to show up because that was, they needed that in that season when they were all alone by themselves. But then it was also a season of a lot of anxiety. I was so anxious that I, 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 I was, you know, like your belly is aching. You all have never been anxious that much. I was so anxious that my belly was aching and I went to the hospital. And I remember my doctor was like, this sounds like anxiety. You are not sick. You are anxious. And that's when I had to take some steps back to like say, hey, you can't control this. You can't fix this. You can just do what you can do, and you're going to have to trust God to let him do the rest that he has to do. Because I was falling physically sick for something that I couldn't control. That's how powerful anxiety is. It can drain life out of the inside of you. So we have to choose, and when it, when, when it, when it, it increases, it makes your productivity to decrease, it makes your ability to function well, to go down. You don't enjoy life. People are like, hey, come, let's go hang out. You're like, I'm sorry, I can't go out because you're so anxious. If I go out, what will happen when I'm outside? That's not how God wants us to live. Life begins to revolve around the fear thing, whatever it may be uh, leading you to loneliness. So there are people who are so lonely. Loneliness is different from being alone. You can be alone and not be lonely. Loneliness is a state where you are alone mostly because you have, it's because you choose to, but then you also have a sense of anger against other people because you feel like they're not involving you. And it's not because they don't want to involve you, it's because you rejected them and now you're all by yourself and you're upset with the people who invited you and you said no. And now you're living life all alone. 
and it just it's, it's, it goes down. It's like a spiral. It just goes one step at a time, downward and downward and downward. And I don't think that God wants us to live like that. We are his sons and daughters. He wants us to live life to the full. The Bible says in John, the thief comes to steal. So anxiety, I would say anxiety and fear comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God comes and you would have life. Live life and live it to its fullest. That's how God wants each one of us to live. So there are two types of fear. We have the fear that we have been talking about. The one that, de that is um, uh, dilapidating, demoralizes, draws energy out of you and all of that. But we also have the fear of God. There are times like, oh, you have to fear God. Fear God is not like, oh, uh, it is a reverence, a respect that you have for God. So those are the two types of fear. So uh, it's different from the fear that comes with anxiety or fear of circumstances or fear of situations. So that is important to be able to take note of. So let's look at um, uh, how fear, anxiety impacts our relationships. There are many relationships that are broken because of fear. There are some people that will not, they, they will not, um, uh, Let's say if I have a misunderstanding with Laurie, instead of talking with Laurie, I just go. And Laurie doesn't even know that I have a misunderstanding with her. She doesn't know that I'm upset with her. And I'm just on the other side. Every time I see her coming, I just pretend like I'm walking on this other side. And I am dying and she doesn't know she's living her life. And she's enjoying, and I'm upset why she's walking freely. But I've never told her why I'm upset with her. Fear, anxiety has a way of breaking relationships. And when I talk about this fear, what is a fear? Fear of confronting. And that's one of the things that I saw. It's like over and over, having lived here, I think, eight years now. I see it in every, among the, I feel that the younger are a little more open. But it's like it's just permeating the system that people don't confront. Like, if I do something to you, come up to me, say, hey, I didn't like that, how you talk to me. Like, oh, I'm sorry, and then we can fix it. But if you never tell me and you're just upset with me, guess what? You are going to be suffering and I'm going to be free. The fear of confronting is a stronghold of the enemy. It's a, it's, it's a demonic spirit that the enemy is using to keep people in bondage. Talk. God has given you the mouth. Talk. Don't talk, don't talk about the person to another one. Go to them and talk to them. They will, not, they will not kill you. They will not beat you. They don't have horns on their head. Because if we don't do that, we can't form healthy relationships. Spouses, who, spouse, those who have been married, they, they can tell you. They've had misunderstandings, but the only way that the relationship has survived the years is because they talk to each other. So what if we talk to one another? When something happens, our relationships are going to be healthier instead of being afraid of what their response will look like if I talk to them. Their response is not your wahala. Wahala, sorry, it's a Cameroon expression. <laughs> it's your responsibility is to just do your part to bring peace in every circumstance. Another thing about fear is when you see somebody who's always perfectionist, most often are trying to cover something underneath. Most perfectionists. There's a difference between excellence and perfectionists. Wanting excellence, I think, is a character of God. But being, being a perfectionist, most often it's a cover for something else underneath. So it's important that I go back and say, why do I want it to always be this way, like 100%? Is there something else underneath that I'm trying to cover that I've not dealt with? It will show up. The next thing is people pleasing. People who suffer with anxiety and fear become people pleasers. They easily, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Or they just go with the flow. They don't want to shake the current. It's okay to shake the current. It's okay. Some of my best friends, I have one of my, my no, I have like a few ladies that, like I say like, they're not mentors, but like they're my peers who speak to me, who speak um, uh, to me like if they see Verma going astray. There's one of them that 
I have so much respect for her that I'm always scared when she called me. <laughs> she is, I love her the most because she's the one person who speaks truth to me. If I'm messing up, she will tell me. And you need those kind of people in your life. And you know why I love her the most? Because she tells, speaks truth to me. There are others that I can easily like, because they're always like, huh, it's okay. Oh, that's fine. Oh, I don't want many of those in my life. They can see me going into a ditch and never help me out. I want someone who can say, hey, you are going into a ditch. That direction is so bad. Come back out this way. <laughs> so you need some good people in your life who speak truth. Don't have everybody around you clap for you. That's dangerous. Does it mean that if you do well, you shouldn't clap? No, when you do well, we should clap. But then also, if you mess up, we should say, hey, that path is not right. Can we change and have the humility enough to embrace the change? The next thing about um, uh, how um, uh, anxiety and fear impact relationships is that most often when there's anxiety, we start to overfunction and we want to control. Anybody comes to your mind? Don't call your name. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I want to ask a question. Are there relationships that, you should be meaning, that, that should be meaningful, peaceful, but that now are messed up? Are there any relationships in your life that were supposed to be meaningful relationships? Are there people that God brought in your life, but somehow now they are messed up because one person was walking in fear or anxious and didn't want to walk in forgiveness? Hopefully, God brings healing and hope. So how does the Bible call us to respond to anxiety and to fear? First Timothy, I feel like I really like this verse. The first thing it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The King James Version says, perfect love casts out every fear. When we genuinely love people, we are not afraid to talk to them. The proof that you can't tell me the truth is the proof that you don't love me. Do you hear that? The proof that you can't tell that person the truth is a proof that you don't love them enough. So when you say, well, I don't want to make them upset, so I'm not going to talk, you are actually saying, I don't love you enough, so it doesn't matter what happens to you. I don't really care. Perfect love casts out all fear. When we genuinely love people, we are not afraid. Spouses are not afraid to be vulnerable to each other because there is genuine love. When you mess up, your, your, you can easily say it because there is genuine love. Genuine love casts out all fear. Not only fear in our relationship, but fear in the way we show ourselves up in the world. When we genuinely experience God's love, we are no longer afraid to live life to its fullest. We know that making mistakes is part of being human. And we can just live. I have to, most often I have to tell myself, you are just human. Don't forget that. So if you make a mistake, you are human. The next, the next, the next verse is say, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, he's given us a power of love. And the love is not, it's not, the, it's not, a, it's not a feeling. Love is, is a character of God that we receive in the inside of us, that enables us to love in unconditional ways. And so the Bible says God has given us, not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And that's why we can't genuinely love people if we've not really known the love of Christ. You can be nice to people, be kind to people, but true love only comes from God. And we can't love people well until we have known the love of Christ. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind and of self-control. What else does the Bible say? The text we read. Do not worry about anything. I'm going to read the NLT, and then after that, I'm going to read my um, uh, message translation so that you can hear that. Do not worry about anything. Did he say some things? Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Pray about everything. Means the little ones, pray about them. 
every little thing, pray about it. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Do not worry about anything. Let me read the message translation. It says, do not fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything working together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. So when you stop worrying and start taking the things that you worry about into prayer, and my message says, God, that Christ will displace worry at the center of your life and fill you with peace and wholeness. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Worry about nothing. So instead of worrying, when the thoughts come, why don't you switch it into a prayer? And say, God, I commit this thing to your hands. I pray about that one. The little ones, the big ones, God wants you to talk to him about. If it make you, makes you anxious, it means it's big enough to be prayed about. He wants us to worry about nothing. But for everything, by prayer and supplication, let us make our request known to God. And when we do that, the Bible says the peace of God which passes all human understanding. That kind of peace that Jesus had in the boat, that he, that he would sleep in the middle of the storm, God will give you that kind of peace. That the storms will be all around you and you are sleeping and people wonder, how do you sleep in the storm? Circumstances will rise up and rage against you, but you will still be able to sleep. It's the kind of peace that God gives God knows how to give peace. A peace that you will be trying to worry, but you won't be able to worry because God's peace settles the inside of you. What else do we need to do if we are going to, to walk above anxiety? What does the Bible tell us to do? It says, finally, my friends, keep your minds on whatever is pure, true, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is holy, whatever is friendly, whatever is proper. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile and worthy of praise. So instead of me being anxious about, oh, if I go on stage and sing again, uh, maybe I'm going to make a mistake and people are going to laugh at me and that's going to be, what if I say, what if I go on stage and sing and people really get blessed? How would that give God glory? So it's not as if the anxiety will not come. But when the anxiety comes and the enemy wants to lie, what if I switch that thought to something that is good, to something that is profitable, to something that is kind? When I'm about to take um, uh, that trip or uh, do uh, something that is like crazy and frightful and the enemy was like, the enemy tells you, oh, you better don't do it. Because what if the machine spoil or you're up there in the air? And what happens to you? And then you think, what if I miss this? Ex what if it's the last time I have to get this experience? So instead of allowing fear to rule, I change it to be something good. What if it's my last time of having this experience? I don't want to miss it. I don't want to say, I came so close to the experience and I missed it because I was afraid. I'm going to just dare and go forth and take this experience. There are many people who have missed out on what God is bringing to them because they have allowed the past to determine how the present looks like. They have allowed what happened in the past to influence the relationships and how they relate to people in the present. My prayer is that God will give each one of us grace to arise from fear, to arise from anxiety, and embrace the life that God has given us to live and live each day with gratitude and start changing the way we think and think positive thoughts and start seeing possibilities in every circumstance. And that's why the Bible says... Uh, I'm ending with this text in Philippians 4. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can walk and live above anxiety. I can walk and live in the freedom that God has called me to do. I can walk in the peace that God has called me to walk in. 
Whatever it is that is making me afraid, I can walk above it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So this morning and this week, as we step out of this place, the enemy will not just leave you go like that. He's going to come again this week to try you. But I want you to confront him with the mind of Christ. To let him know that that person that he saw last week, something happened to them on Sunday, the 2nd of July, 2023. And he no longer, anxiety no longer has the power. Anxiety can no longer rule that you have chosen to walk in freedom and enjoy this life that God has called you to enjoy. I want to hear stories of some things that you have wanted to do a long time, but fear kept you. And you are like saying, hey, Pastor Vama, I would like to do this. And if you want me to pray for you, yes, I'm going to pray with you. But God's desire is that we live life to its fullest. Enjoy it when God still gives you life. Don't leave it halfway. Don't let anything steal the fullness of life that God has. Don't let anything, anybody, nothing has the power except you give it the power. There's a saying that says, fear can keep us up all night long, but faith makes one fine pillow. Fear can keep us up all night long, but faith, it just makes one fine pillow and you can sleep and rest. Let us pray. Oh God, we want to rest in you. We want to embrace the peace that you have called us to walk in. And so this morning we come and we take authority over the spirit of anxiety, of fear, of worry that allows, that causes us to live in loneliness. We break its grip from off our lives. We ask that you give us the grace to walk in freedom, the freedom that you have called us to walk in, God. Let your peace that passes all human understanding fill our hearts and mind. Not only for those of us who are seated in this place, but for those who are watching online, for those who are going to come and watch this later. Let the spirit and the hold of anxiety be broken. Let your people live life to its fullness, God. That is your will. And we say thank you. In Jesus' name.